Thanks very much. Um, is this microphone working? Guys, microphone working? Yeah, this, this guy in the front row can hear me, so that's, that's good enough. Um, so, uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the topological objects I'm going to be talking about are um, uh, the smooth concordance group of knots and uh, the smooth uh, slice genus, otherwise known as the smooth four-ball genus of knots. Okay, um, well, so there's somebody in that booth at the back who needs this microphone to be working. Yeah, I don't know. No, okay, okay, now it's working. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so let me start by defining some stuff, and then we can then we can do some math. Um, all right, so so suppose you've got two knots, k zero and k one and they happily live inside um, the, the three-sphere. Uh, I'm going to think of knots as being oriented in this talk. Um, I can take each of them and put them inside a different copy of the three-sphere. So here's K0 sitting inside a copy of the three-sphere labeled with zero. Um, and down here, here's K1 sitting inside the three-sphere label with a copy of one. Um, and in between them is the three-sphere times the interval 0, 1. And a knot cobordism between these two knots is a surface that lies inside this four-dimensional space whose boundary is, is the knot K0 and the knot K1. Um, the two boundaries. That's what this thing is. Um, and we're going to think about particular, um, we're going to put some conditions on sigma g. It's going to be um, connected, uh, oriented, compact. And we're going to put some conditions on that uh, embedding as well. This embedding is going to be smooth. Um, and then this whole setup, we're going to call a knot cobordism from K0 to K1. This is a genus G um, knot cobordism. Is it okay? So I can think of it as like a morphism between the two knots. Um, all right, so a particular kind of uh, knot cobordism is a knot cobordism of genus zero. Um, and that gives me an equivalence relation on knots. It goes like this, it's called uh, concordance. So K is equivalent to K zero, um, if and only if there exists a genus zero knot cobordism. From, uh, from, so K is equivalent to K prime if there's a genus zero knot cobordism from K to K prime. Um, that's a Equivalence relation, I can turn the knot cobordism upside down to get symmetry. You can stack them together to get um, transitivity. Um, and uh, so the classes, known as concordance classes, I should say, so this, this, is, uh, this is the concordance relation. So let's call those two knots concordant. And a set of equivalence classes are called the concordance classes, and they form a group. <coughs> Um, under the operation of connected sum. <coughs> um, the, uh, the identity element is the equivalence class of the unknot. Taking connect sum with the unknot doesn't change the knot you first thought of. Um, and the inverses are you take the mirror image and reverse the orientation. Um, so this is uh, one thing we're going to study. This group we're going to write as uh, curly C, okay. Um, another thing we're going to study is the, is the four-ball genus, otherwise known as the, the slice genus, and this is the definition I'm going to take of it. Well, so first of all, 
it's going to be um, a non-negative integer. And it's defined in this way. This is the genus of a minimal genus cobordism um, that takes uh, not k to the unknot. So this may be a slightly different definition from a definition you might have seen before. Um, usually you define the, the four-ball genus to be um, the mineral genus of a surface inside the four ball, as the name suggests, whose boundary is the knot on the three sphere. It's equivalent to this definition. If you have such a surface, you can just puncture it and get a um, cobordism to the unknot. Whereas if you have a cobordism to the unknot, you can just cap off the unknot and get a closed surface in the four ball. But this is a definition that, that's going to be more useful for us. So. Um, all right, so uh, that's all the definitions. Those are the objects we're going to study. Um, I got told recently that I was a not theorist. Just somebody mentioned that to me in passing. It's always a bit um, disconcerting to be like uh, told what you are. Do you know what I mean? Um, especially when you don't necessarily agree. Um, I tend to think of myself as more of a not practitioner, I guess. And to be practical about things, Here's a knot. And this is a knot that we're going to apply our invariance to. Um, and it's a, it's a knot that's interesting from the point of view of these invariants. That's more or less why we picked it. So it's the 125th uh, 10 crossing knot in the knot atlas. It's a pretzel knot. It's a P minus, it's P2 minus 3, 5. And we're going to um, call it uh, P for this talk, I guess. Um, there's, a, there's a picture of it in its, in its pretzel format. Um, it's a four-ball genus, I'll tell you right now, is, is one. You can tell the four-ball genus is less than or equal to one because you can just exhibit a cobordism to the unknot. This is what the little, uh, little orange guys are meant to indicate. I can add a, a one handle here that sort of undoes these two crossings. And then three crossings there cancel with three of these five crossings. You're left with the hop flink. Um, and then you add another one handle to connect the two components of the hop flink, you get down to the unknot. So that's a genus one cobordism to the unknot. And in fact, there's, there's a whole bunch of invariants that tell you that um, you can't do any better than that. So this is one knot we're going to be interested in. Another family of knots we're going to be interested in is the PQ torus knots. Um, it turns out the four-ball genus of the PQ torus knots is P minus one times Q minus one over two. That's a, that's a theorem from the prehistory of mathematics. Um, it's proved way back in the 90s by, um, by Kronheimer and Rovka. Um, so we're going to um, see that showing up a bit later. Um, all right, so what are, what are the invariants we're going to use to study the objects that we're, we're interested in? Well, um, they are the uh, SLN Kovanov Rosensky cohomologies. Um, and th these are what we're going to use. Um, Original, originally defined by uh, Kovnov and Rosensky, unsurprisingly. And we're going to write them like this. Um, so let me take you through some indices here. So i and j, these are going to be integers. Um, they even come with special names. i is the cohomological grading. Um, and j is called the quantum grading. And we, we give it that name because it sounds better in grant applications. I think that's why we do it. This n is coming from the SLN. And the x at the moment, you just think of as being a placeholder. It doesn't mean anything, OK? It's like, uh, it's just there. And the, the k is the knot, and the h is the h in cohomology, or the h in covenant, I suppose. Um, and this thing is a finite dimensional vector space. for any value of i and j. In fact, the cohomology is very finite dimensional. If I took the sum over all i, j of these guys, I'd still end up with a finite dimensional vector space. And um, let's make it a complex vector space. Um, 
All right, so this is the SLN uh, kovnov rosansky cohomology, and these are the invariants we're going to use. Uh, maybe I should tell you uh, a bit about them. They don't just come out of, of thin air. They're a categorification of something. So, well, let's put that there. Okay, suppose I do this. Um, so what is this? This is like a, an Euler characteristic. If I cover up the Q to the J, it just looks like an alternating sum of dimensions over the cohomological degree. So I'm basically doing this Euler characteristic once for each J, and then the Euler characteristic comes and appears as a coefficient of J in some, uh, some Laurent polynomial. Um, this is what it means for um, kovnov rosansky cohomology to categorify something. It categorifies this polynomial. This polynomial is the uh, SLN not polynomial. There's no reason why you should know what that is. This is a specialization of, uh, of the Homfley polynomial. So Homfley polynomial is a, a two variable polynomial. Um, there's some substitution, depending on n, that gets you to a one variable polynomial and then you recover the SLN not polynomial from it. Um, in some sense, uh, the Homfley polynomial, you can think of it as being the large n limit of these SLN polynomials. Um, okay, fantastic. Uh, all right, so what does this cohomology look like? Well, let me tell you. So um, n here for SLN to make sense should be greater than or equal to 1. So the first case is uh, n equals 1. Um, and what you get out of it is a uh, one-dimensional vector space. And that one-dimensional vector space is supported in bi-grading 0, 0. So, um, so pretty boring for SL1. For SL2, well, what do we get? Uh, SL2 polynomial is, a ca is, a, is the Jones polynomial. So this thing is a categorification of the Jones polynomial. So you'd expect this thing to be isomorphic to um, Kovanov cohomology. Um, and indeed it is. And this, this equivalence is, a, is, a, is due to Hughes. So there's just the one categorification of the Jones polynomial around. Um, so that's what it is for n equals 1 and n equals 2. And um, for higher n, it isn't either of those things. It's something else. Um, OK. All right. So uh, let's see. So I don't want to tell you um, the entire construction of these things. That would take probably longer than this talk. But let me tell you um, a bit about it. So the construction involves a choice of a monic polynomial W in C adjoin X of degree N. All right, and this is the x to the n that appears um, in, the, in the subscript. So when Kovnov and Zansky first uh, made this definition, they just did the definition for the choice polynomial that's x to the n. But the construction can be repeated um, with any uh, monic polynomial of degree n. OK. Um, and then what does it give you once you made this choice? Well, it um, gives you this. So to a not diagram D, I get um, something that depends on W and D. This is a filtered um, co-chain complex. Um, and it's filtered co-chain complex of modules. 
of indeed of three modules, and those modules are modules over C join X um, mod W. Okay, and even this cochain complex is very finite dimensional. If I take the union over um, all the J's, which is a filtration thing, and then the direct sum over all the I's, it's still a finite dimensional um, beast. Okay, so um, and then the cohomology of this thing is is like the invariant. Um, so we're in a situation where we've got a uh, cochain complex with a filtration on it. This filtration is preserved by the differential. Let me be specific about how that looks. So for each choice of i, um, I've got a, got a filtration. Um, and if I go far enough to the left, I just get the, uh, the zero module. If I go far enough to the right, eventually my modules stop changing. Um, and a differential preserves that filtration degree and raises the cohomological degree by one. Okay, so that's what's up with that. All right. Um, and so when you're in a situation where you've got a, a filtered cochain complex and the differential preserves the filtration, um, that gives rise to spectral sequences. So it turns out that every page of this spectral sequence, once you get beyond the chain complex page, um, is a not invariant. E2 page is something we've already seen before. Um, so the E2 page is exactly this uh, kovnov uh, rosansky SLN invariant as originally defined by Kovnov and Rosansky. Um, the E infinity page, what does it compute? Well, let me write it down. So the E infinity page computes this. Um, the fact that you've got a differential preserving the filtration induces a filtration on the, on the total cohomology. Um, and this is the associated graded thing to the filtration. Um, and the infinity page um, is, is just exactly that. Um, so we can make the definition that we write this thing as Hij W of K. OK? All right. So um, we're getting a little far from uh, topology in the original questions I asked, it seems. Did you say w can be x to the n? W can be x to the n, yeah. And then these are the same. Then they're the same when a spectral sequence uh, collapses at the E2 page. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're getting a little far from topology. <laughs> I want to bring us slowly back around to that. To do that, I'm going to fix a particular choice of. Um, uh, potential. Did I tell you that W was called a potential? I didn't. Okay, so when I say potential, I mean this polynomial W. Um, so we're going to fix a particular uh, kind of W, and we'll see what that has to do with topology. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, fix W equals uh, X minus Let's see, let's do it like this. X minus alpha i, where the alpha i rule um, distinct. And now I'm doing this, and because it's like five past five, I know Lucas was, will have submitted his applications by now, so I can tell you that everything that follows is joint work with uh, Lucas Lewark. Um, so we're going to fix W to be, to be this thing. 
Um, and then there's some facts I want to tell you about the, uh, the cohomology. So first of all, um, Hij W of K is n-dimensional. That is, if I take the sum over all Ij, you, you understand what I mean. So it's an n-dimensional thing. Um, and is supported in degree um, i equals zero. Okay, so it looks kind of um, possibly a bit boring from the point of view of just being a, an n-dimensional vector space, but it's got some interest in, maybe it's in interesting j degrees. That's the only interest that it can hold. Um, and a not cobordism induces a map that looks like this. Um, Well, let's make i equal to zero. Okay, so what am I saying? So, um, a not cobordism, um, and I'm using my notation for not cobordism I had before, which is sigma goes from k1 to k0, is going to induce a map um, on the homologies. I've taken the union over the filtration. So on the left is just an n-dimensional vector space, and on the right is just an n-dimensional vector space. It turns out that this thing um, is an isomorphism of n-dimensional vector spaces. OK. So. Let's do that. So um, furthermore, this map is, uh, is a filtered map and is filtered of degree equal to um, Minus two times n minus one times the genus of the surface. So it's something that's um, proportional to the genus of that surface. All right. And yet, it's giving me an isomorphism between um, this cohomology and this cohomology. So this enables you to make um, some conclusions. So let me tell you what those conclusions are. So um, first conclusion. Hi, well, it's i equal to zero. There is that. This thing is a concordance invariant. In other words, the j degrees of this thing are just an invariant of the concordance class of k. So why is that? Well, suppose I've got two concordant knots, k and um, k prime then um, I take a concordance between them, and that gives me a degree zero filtered map from the homology of k to the homology of k prime. And by turning the concordance upside down, I get a degree filtered map from the homology of k prime to the homology of k. Since both those maps are isomorphisms, and since both those maps are filtered of degree zero, they, um, they give me an isomorphism between the two filtrations. Hence, this thing is a concordance invariant, so it gives us some information about the concordance classes. In fact, um, more than that, also the, uh, the j distance um, from k 
from the cohomology of the unknot gives rise um, to lower bounds on on the formal genus of K. So what do I mean? So suppose I've got a um, not cobordism between K and the unknot um, that's of genus G. Okay, so now I have my not cobordism between K and the unknot of genus G, and it's inducing an isomorphism. Well, by turning that cobordism upside down, I also get a, a not cobordism from the unknot to K of genus G. So I've got two um, isomorphisms. The fact that one is filtered of degree depending on the genus sort of bounds the distance apart these things can be in one direction, and the other one bounds the distance apart that these homologies can be um, in the second direction. Um, and so that's why this J distance um, gives rise to lower bounds on the forward gene. Okay, so maybe it's not totally clear. Maybe I'm not being totally precise about J distance, but I hope you, you roughly get the idea, and you're gonna see in a second um, an example. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's think about some examples. Seems like a likely board. All right, so the examples we're gonna think about, we're gonna restrict um, the potential W to having degree three. We're still thinking about the case where W is a product of, um, of distinct linear factors. Does that make sense? All right, so what I've drawn on the left-hand side of the board is um, the value of this cohomology for the unknot. This is what it looks like. It's three copies of C supported in degree um, I equals zero, um, and they're in J degrees two, zero, and minus two. That's what the cohomology unknot looks like. That's that picture there. Um, the cohomology of the PQ torus knot looks like a shifted copy of the unknot. And the amount it's shifted by is uh, minus four times the four ball genus of, of TPQ. That's equal to minus two times P minus one times Q minus one, but I couldn't fit it into the board. Um, so if you think about what I've told you uh, about the filtered degree of this map and this number here, um, this gives a, a reproof um, of the uh, of the four ball genus of TPQ being the same as the three ball genus being P minus one times Q minus one over two. All right, so this is, uh, this is what this cohomology looks like for the unknot, and for PQ torus knot, it's just a shift of an amount depending on the four ball genus of TPQ. What about for our, um, our pretzel knot, P uh, two minus three five? Well, um, let's think about computing this um, thing from a spectral sequence. So what I've drawn here, this is, the, uh, this is the E2 page of a spectral sequence that's gonna compute this final page. Now, the E2 page doesn't depend on the choice of W. W is just some degree three polynomial that's a product of distinct linear factors. E2 page is always just your standard SL3 kovnov rosensky cohomology. Um, and I've drawn uh, this part of it um, there is some more of it. It extends a bit to the, uh, to the southwest and northeast, but this is the part that's sort of a, around um, I equals zero. And I've drawn uh, the I gradings along there and the uh, J gradings up here. Um, if a square has a, a number inside it, that means I'm seeing a vector space of that dimension um, in, the, in that particular bigrading. Does that make sense? All right, fantastic. So now I want to compute these E infinity pages. I've got two of them that I'd like to compute. One for the um, W equals X cubed minus one, and one for W equals X cubed minus X. Um, so how do I go about it? Well, um, here's a fact. <laughs> if I look at the uh, differentials in the spectral sequence for X, for the, for X cubed minus one, um, they all have a J degree divisible by six. And the reason is, is that this polynomial is um, mod three homogeneous and X has J degree two. Okay, so there's, there's some reason that, that um, 
the j degrees in a spectral sequence are all divisible by six. So now I look over here, and I know I want to end up with something of dimension three um, inside uh, grading i equals zero. So I know that these ones have got to cancel some stuff, and this one's got to cancel some stuff. And I look at what possible things they can cancel. Well, um, this one's got to cancel with this two. This one's got to cancel with this three, is this right? And this three has got to be a cancellation there. Because these are the only maps that have um, j degree divisible by six. Um, so the, the conclusion is, is that the cohomology um, for uh, this pretzel not p um, using w equals x cubed minus one is exactly this, one, one, one. <clears throat> it's another shifted on not. Okay, so far so boring. Now we shift to uh, this computation, x cubed minus x. So this is a, a mod two homogeneous polynomial. Every power of x is odd. Um, and that tells me that the uh, maps in a spectral sequence have uh, j degree divisible by four. Right, so I look at what can possibly cancel with this three, and the only thing that can cancel with this three is this one and nothing else, and this one can't cancel with anything else. So I know at least that there's a, a two here. And then if you make the computation, you find out that you have a one there and a zero there. And I should say that all these computations can be done entirely by hand in the sense that you can use your hands to build a computer and then program it. <laughs> um, all right. So the reason that I'm choosing this pretzel knot um, 10125 is it's the, uh, is it's the first knot <clears throat> which has any um, cohomology that doesn't look like a shifted on knot that I've been able to discover. Um, it's, the first, yeah, it's the first knot in the knot table with any um, SLN cohomology that doesn't look like a shifted on knot. Um, there is one uh, earlier knot in the knot table that might have that property, but we haven't yet um, found any, um, any, uh, any values of W that, that work well for it. Um, all right, so uh, I want to say that this, the shape of this, um, this E infinity page can be very strange and depends very strongly on which polynomial you, you plug in here. Um, and we don't really have any, uh, there seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. It can be, uh, it can be crazy, it can be all over the place. It doesn't need to be supported. Um, these numbers don't need to be supported close to each other. They can be very far, far spread out and stuff. Um, all right, so that gives me a, a nice uh, concordance in variant. Any questions about that stuff? All right. So let me... Uh, <clears throat> tell you about something else then. Sort of in passing. So slice torus invariants phi, what, what are they? So slice torus invariants satisfy um, three properties. First of all is their um, homomorphisms. Um, from the concordance group into, say, the rational numbers. Okay, so they're, they're um, concordance invariants and they're homomorphisms on that group, rational numbers. The, uh, the slice part of the name tells you that they provide a lower bound on the slice genus, or rather their absolute value does. Uh, and the torus part of the name tells you that um, that bound is tight for torus knots. Okay, so this is a slice torus invariant. So there's no reason a priori to expect that such a thing exists, of course. Um, and as soon as you know that one exists, it gives you a proof of this, um, gives you a proof that the formal genus of the PQ torus knot was what you think it was. 
So the first one that was discovered was the tau from um, uh, Knopfler homology, and another one was uh, S, Rasmussen's S from uh, Kovanov homology. I guess these need to be suitably normalized to make sense. You need to divide them through by the value they take on the left-handed trefoil, and that'll give you a sliced torus invariant. Um, so um, we get sliced torus invariants out of uh, kovanov rosansky cohomology as well. So a choice of W. So now W can be uh, any potential, except I want it to have a, at least one simple root. meaning a root of multiplicity one, this gives rise to slice torus invariant. Which we could write as uh, SW alpha. And the idea is, is that um, the alpha tells you how to um, pick out a particular subcomplex of the complex we've been talking about, and that subcomplex has cohomology that's one-dimensional, and the J degree of the one-dimensional piece just gives you a slice torus invariant. Um, and, well, I want to say that this has strong dependence on the choice of, uh, of W and alpha. Um, all right. So if you're interested in slice torus invariants, you might think that um, S and tau is the end of the story. But even if we just restrict to um, degree three uh, potentials, uh, we can cook up um, three more um, slice torus invariants, which are linearly independent from S and tau, giving you a five-dimensional um, space of slice torus invariants that are linearly independent kind of within that space. Um, and there's no reason why we had to stop at three. It was more or less just the first three things we thought of to write down. So um, I'm just sort of saying this in passing. If you think that the slice torus invariants end at S and tau, you shouldn't think that. You should think that the, the study of slice torus invariants begins at S and tau. And I think that um, questions about the space of such things are, are rather interesting. Um, what's the What's the maximum they can say about um, sliceness and slice genera of knots? Um, all right, so I don't want to leave that story there, I guess, and tell you instead, <clears throat> there's another whole talk on that stuff, but I want to tell you about another game that one can play. Um, and this goes like this, so we're going to fix W to be, uh, to be this potential. So uh, what is this potential? X to the n minus uh, X to the n minus 1. So this has uh, one simple root at X equals 1, and one root of multiplicity n minus 1. That's at uh, X equals 0. So in particular, you can <clears throat> get a slice torus invariant out of this thing. So get a slice torus invariant out of that thing, SW1. So SW1, um, well, apart from being a very exclusive London postal code and an interesting slice torus invariant in its own right, um, you can do something else with it. Moreover, By blending the filtration FJ and the filtration um, so let me tell you what this filtration is.
So I'm going to blend two filtrations. One of them is a usual quantum filtration. Other filtration is this one. Um, so essentially, it's a filtration that asks if I've got an element, how many times does x divide it? Remember, um, this complex was a complex of modules over C join x mod w. So the reason we chose uh, this potential is because uh, um, is because the, the root at zero has a very high multiplicity. If, um, for example, uh, this thing didn't have a root at zero, x would be a unit in the ground ring, and this filtration would be entirely trivial. Um, okay, so by blending these two filtrations, um, we get a piecewise linear concordance invariant. We get um, a um, concordance invariant. Like this. Yeah. Which takes the form of a piecewise linear function on an interval um, and is a concordance invariant. If there's any dreidel fans in the audience, this is, uh, this is a gimmel. Alright. So, of course, um, there's an obvious inspiration for this construction. Though I should mention, which is the upsilon invariant from Hagard Fleur um, homology. So, like, oh, France, Allah, uh, France, uh, Al upsilon. All right. Um, so, this is uh, it's just a concordance invariant of knots. Um, let me tell you some properties of it, or let me tell you what, it, what its value is in certain knots. So Gimelin of the unknot is trivial. It's uh, the zero function. What does it look like on torus knots? Well, I can tell you that. Um, looks like this looks linear on torus knots. Okay. Um, what does it look like on our um, special knot P? So, well, I'll tell you what um, Gimel 3 looks like on P. And I'll draw a picture of it. So, uh, it's the point sum 0, 1, and a half. This is a uh, T direction. Minus quarter, minus one. Uh, there. So it has a break point at, um, at t equals a half. So um, for those people who know a bit about epsilon, um, this second statement looks a bit disappointing because epsilon has interesting things to say about um, um, torus knots in their um, concordance class. Um, However, um, people who know about epsilon should find this, this statement rather exciting um, because here's something I didn't tell you earlier. So P is a quasi-alternating knot. I forgot to mention. Um, and of course, epsilon is, uh, is, is boring on quasi-alternating knots. So in a sense, this invariant um, Gimel uh, is, is giving us somewhat uh, orthogonal information to the invariant epsilon. Um, okay. So uh, let me tell you some properties. Uh, 
Um, so first property, uh, Gimelin is a uh, quasi homomorphism. On the concordance group, <clears throat> so it, take, it maps the concordance group into piecewise linear functions on an interval. It's not a homomorphism, but it's a quasi-homomorphism. Quasi-homomorphism. What does it mean? <clears throat> well, it means if I look at the value that this thing takes on k, add it to the value it takes on uh, k prime, and subtract off the value it takes on k, connect some k prime. That is always bounded, and it's a bound independent of those knots. So it's a homomorphism up to a bounded uh, error term. That's what quasi-homomorphism means. Um, if I look at the uh, derivative at 0, Gimel always starts out at, at 0. And its derivative at 0 is SW1, which is a slice torus invariant. So this is a bit like epsilon. Um, whose derivative is, uh, is tau. Um, what else? Uh, at the other endpoint, Gimel in one is, uh, is super additive. Um, and finally, And finally, it provides a lower bound on the four-ball genus all the way along. So if I look at the absolute value of Gimel in T over T, this is a lower bound for the four-ball genus. Thing on the left and thing on the right, um, both missing an argument. You've got to drop in a K. Um, and if you do that, um, this number is less than or equal to that one. Um, Okay, so these are, these are the invariants that we know um, arising from quantum knot homologies um, that have something to say about the four-ball genus um, and the concordance group. So let me tell you uh, one or two things that they're good for. So I'm going to give you some facts. So here's a fact. Um, so there exists K on which all known slice torus invariants are trivial, meaning S tau and all the ones that come out of kovanov rosansky homology. Um, but, but his sliceness is obstructed by Um, by this cohomology. Um, so that's the first thing. Seems to be better than um, uh, slice torus invariance. Here's another fact. Um, there exists K, um, and now I want to copy this, on which all known slice torus invariants are Trivial, just hope that doesn't read anything rude. Um, there exists a K in which all known slice torus invariants are trivial. Um, upsilon is trivial, don't know how to write upsilon. Um, this invariant phi, due to uh, Golo and Meringion, is, I uh, probably mispronounced that horribly, um, is trivial. Um, but sliceness is obstructed by. Uh, by Gimel 3 being non-zero. Um, and, well, I think that's the only two facts I want to tell you right now. So I'm going to end there. Thanks very much. <laughs>